welcome Nick. All right, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and thank you also for inviting me. Uh, so hopefully you guys can see my, my screen now, uh, the slideshow. Um, so yeah, I was really excited to be a part of the Institute for Immunology, um, just to get exposed to a lot of the different types of immunology that I'm not used to seeing. And hopefully it's a reciprocal relationship and I can kind of introduce you to some, like how I make inroads into the immunology field uh, through what I do. Um, so really, my research is kind of at the intersection of, of cancer and, and immunology. And what I'm really interested in, as you can tell by the talk, is the physiological processes that happen in B cells um, that keep us safe, uh, examining what happens when sometimes those can go wrong and how they can lead to several types of uh, the cancers that we, uh, that we see. Uh, so, I mean, this slide isn't really news to anybody. Uh, we all know that uh, cancer is a major, major global health problem. Um, and it's a uh, leading cause of death. And as, you know, as our population ages, it seems that we're seeing even more and more cases of, of cancer uh, in the population. Um, it's projected to become a major burden on our healthcare system, uh, just as more and more people are getting treated for it. Um, and so what do we know now about cancer? Um, you know, and so when we started this war on cancer back in the 70s, uh, we say, say we, but obviously I wasn't, I wasn't there at that point. Um, you know, we started creating, creating the NCI and putting a lot of money uh, towards cancer research. And during that time, we've, there's been an amazing amount of research. We've learned so much about cancer. Um, but if you just compile all the different types of cancers that are out there um, and look at the mortality rate since 1975, you can see that we've only really seen about a 7 point. 5% drop. Um, so of course, this is tallying all the cancers together. So we've made a lot of progress with some cancers, but other cancers have gotten more out of hand over that time. But if we compare that to something like, say, cardiovascular disease, where around in the same time frame we saw more of a 70% decrease in mortality, we kind of ask ourselves, like, well, what's going on here? And why is it that uh, these mortality rates for cancer are not decreasing as much? And of course, the answer for that is that if, uh, cardiovascular disease is kind of targeting one, one system. Uh, whereas cancer targets multiple organ systems, multiple tissues, and has multiple causes. So it's very much more a moving target and much harder to, um, to understand and to prevent um, and to treat as well. So we can see that just from here, um, cancer can affect almost every type of organ system uh, in our bodies uh, to varying degrees and varying, uh, with varying aggressiveness. So clearly cancer is a very uh, heterogeneic disease, um, but hopefully we can all at least agree that one common feature of of cancer is that at the very heart of it, the very initiation step uh, is usually a genetic change that affects the DNA. Um, and this DNA change leads these cells to become, uh, to change from normal cells uh, to become hyperproliferative cancer cells. And there's actually a number of different mutations that can occur. They can be very subtle, uh, such as single base changes or single nucleotide changes uh, to lead to missense mutations, nonsense mutations, or even frame shift mutations. Uh, or they can be very much more severe, uh, like chromosomal rearrangements. Uh, and these are the actual, the types of uh, DNA changes that I'm most interested in studying in my lab, uh, particularly chromosomal translocations. So no doubt you've heard of chromosomal translocations, um, particularly with uh, B cell cancers. And as a way, of just, just to kind of introduce the topic, probably the most famous uh, translocation is the Philadelphia chromosome. Uh, which is a reciprocal translocation that occurs between chromosome 9 and chromosome 2. Uh, and just to kind of introduce what these translocations are, is essentially you have, you have double strand breaks that are being created all the time in your cells, and our body is really efficient at repairing that, that, those damages. Um, but what can happen in some cases is that you have a DNA double strand break that occurs uh, to cleave these chromosomes. And you can have two DNA double strand breaks occurring simultaneously on two different chromosomes. And most of the time when that happens, uh, you'll have the DNA repair machinery to repair these double strand breaks. So you end up with what you started with, uh, these two different chromosomes. But what seems to happen in some cases, we're not exactly sure why at this point, uh, we can get a translocation, which is essentially those chromosome arms swap. Um, and we end up with what we have here is this Philadelphia chromosome, uh, where it's a hybrid of chromosome 9 and chromosome 22. And for this particular disease, it's really interesting that the double strand breaks actually occur within two genes, so ABLE and BCR. And when it comes together to form this uh, translocation, it actually creates this hybrid BCR-ABLE, uh, which is a considerably active pyrosine kinase. And this is what drives this uh, particular cancer uh, to be hyperproliferative because it has this uh, kinase that can never get turned off. 
So of course, uh, hematopoietic malignancies are quite diverse. Um, what this pie chart here is just showing is all the number of different um, malignancies that, that can occur. Uh, in humans, the vast majority of these are all B-cell based. Uh, there are some T-cell uh, malignancies. Um, and if we consider the Philadelphia chromosome and how often that occurs in a lot of these diseases, we see that that particular uh, uh, chromosomal translocation is representative of mostly all the cases of, of CML, uh, where over 90% of those cases will have this translocation as a uh, present. Um, but we see that kind of still leaves a lot of open area here uh, in terms of other types of genome rearrangements that could be occurring um, in these cells. Okay. So for my lab, what I'm really interested in is most cells would rather go out of their way to avoid a double strand break. And when double strand breaks do occur, um, the cell wants to get them repaired as efficiently as possible. Uh, a single double strand break that lingers in a cell can actually be lethal to that cell, uh, especially if that cell has to undergo replication. Uh, and that's why I'm really fascinated by the biology of B cells. Because uh, as I said, while most cells avoid double strand breaks, B cells actually create double strand breaks in their genome. Um, and this is obviously a required process um, because um, two times during the development of B cells, double strand breaks are required uh, to diversify our antibody pools uh, in our bodies. And so what this is just kind of showing here is the progression of of a B cell from a stem cell through the uh, pre pro B uh, cell stage uh, to the mature uh, cells in our body. And it's during this process that we have things uh, such as in the pre B cells, we have VDJ recombination um, that targets chromosome 14, uh, among other places, uh, the immunoglobulin heavy chain locus, uh, targeting the five prime region of uh, the IGH locus here to rearrange these uh, B, D, and J regions. And also in more mature B cells, we have a process known as class switch recombination that's occurring. Uh, and so these are two very different mechanisms with the same end that double strand breaks are created to rearrange these different uh, regions. So why would our body do this? Um, I'm sure, you know, being in this group, you all know the answer to that is that if we didn't have this process, we wouldn't have a functional immune system to be able to fight uh, diseases like COVID or black plague or anything like that uh, in, our, in our cells. And so the process of VDJ recombination by rearranging these, the five prime end of the IGH locus uh, changes this variable region of the antibody. So the heavy chain here on the inside of this Y so they can recognize several different types of antigens. And then we have class switch recombination, um, which allows the antibody, uh, different antibody classes to be generated uh, depending on where the breaks and, and rearrangements occur uh, to allow for the coding of each of these different, uh, uh, these different regions uh, for the antibody. So as you can tell from the talk, um, and as you'll see as the talk progresses, the major thing that I'm going to be focusing on is VDJ recombination. Um, there will be a little bit of talk about class switch recombination, but kind of only peripherally, only to explain uh, a few of the mechanisms that we're seeing uh, in our cells. Um, going back to this pie chart, though, so if we know that these double strand breaks are being created uh, in, in these cells to, to create these antibody uh, pools that are necessary, we can ask, again, how many of these different diseases have a broken IGH uh, at, as part of their rearrangement? And the answer to that is, is quite a few. Um, some of them much more than others. So you can see that, say, follicular lymphoma, um, over 85% of the cases have a rearrangement involving IGH. A large number of the diffuse large B cell lymphomas and mantle cell lymphomas um, involve IGH. So clearly, even though this process has, over uh, millions of years of evolution uh, through different species, has become very efficient, uh, things do go wrong sometimes, and when they do go wrong, they can lead to these different types of cancers. So I just kind of, I'll kind of come back to slides and this mechanism uh, a little bit more, but I just kind of wanted to briefly go over the process of VDJ recombination uh, as it's, it's relevant to understanding the different types of B-cell malignancies and translocations that, um, that we study. Um, and also just to kind of give you an idea of the different types of DNA double strand break repair mechanisms uh, that we're focusing on in the lab. Uh, and so as you can see here, uh, VDJ recombination starts uh, with a double strand breaks that are created by the RAG complex, so, so the react, uh, recombination activating gene complexes. And the RAG complex uh, recognizes the, these 12 and 23 uh, recombination signal sequences that are in the B and J regions, and also the D if you're considering the heavy chain. And what happens here is that the RAG complex actually nicks these regions. Um, and through that nicking process eventually leads to uh, the creation of a DNA double strand break. Uh, 
Um, once these DNA double strand breaks are created through for this process, they're repaired through a process called non-homologous end joining or NHEJ. Um, so this is one of the dominant repair pathways for double strand breaks in mammalian cells. Um, and once the NHEJ recognizes these double strand breaks and repairs them, uh, this is how you end up with your uh, repaired uh, coding joint, which is what codes for the antibody, and also the signal joint, which gets released as a, as a closed circle here. And so I'll get a little bit more into some of these processes and how they're relevant as we go on. Uh, but really the take home here is that we have this double strand breaks induced by uh, this B cell specific or, or, and also in T cells uh, complex that cuts these, uh, these B and J regions. Um, and then we have the NHEJ uh, repair process coming in to repair those breaks. And this is how we get diversification uh, through several other steps uh, of these regions. Um, and so a lot of these you're probably familiar with if you've ever worked with any type of SCID system. Um, if you have mutations in RAG1 or RAG2, um, you have this uh, immunodeficiency because you aren't actually able to cleave to start this process of BDJ recombination. Um, and also another major NHEJ factor that if you get rid of leads to a SCID phenotype is DNA PKCS, uh, which is shown here, uh, which you know you get the SCID mount that has this mutation process here. And the problem here is that you can still induce the breaks with RAGs, um, but now you're unable to repair them because you're lacking this essential uh, NHEJ repair uh, machine. So how is that relevant to what's going on in these B cells to create several types of translocations? So a translocation, as I said, requires two DNA double strand breaks to happen at the same time. Um, and with the processes that are going on physiologically in B cells, we're already part of the way there because we have B cells creating DNA double strand breaks uh, during this process of say VDJ recombination, which is illustrated here. And so we know how one of these DNA double strand breaks that is occurring um, what the real mystery in this whole process and for the etiology of several of these translocations is what's causing the other DNA double strand break that leads to the uh, breaks elsewhere in the genome that leads to these translocations. Uh, and so what we're really interested in studying in our lab is how these uh, unrepaired double strand breaks induced by RAG are somehow able to interact with double strand breaks elsewhere in the genome to create these translocations. And, and what these, this table here is showing is that several of the major um, translocations that occur. Um, and so actually by going back through and looking at patient samples, we're actually able to map, map where the translocation junctions occur. And for each of these situations, each of these translocations, you can see that they all involve, well, except for this exception here, which I can get into at some point, um, all involve the IGH locus. And the IGH locus, specifically uh, rearrangements where each of these uh, different uh, chromosomes or DNA ends are joined with usually a J region from BDJ. And so the only reason, the only way that these double strand breaks get interact with this broken J region is if these translocations all occur during uh, the pre B cell stage when BDJ recombination is happening uh, because the expression of RAG is very tightly controlled. Uh, and so what's really important to, to note here is that even though these are all diverse uh, genome rearrangements and have diverse cancers, the progenitor step uh, that leads to these translocations is actually happening in pre B cells. And so even for some of these, um, these cancers that actually present in more mature B cells, what happens is, is that it's at this pre B cell stage that the rearrangement happens. That cell is somehow is selected to allow to keep growing and it matures and it acquires more hits along the way to eventually lead it to become a cancer. Um, but the progenitor step and the prime step in these translocation uh, processes for a lot of these all occur during this BDJ. And we know that just by looking at the translocations that are present in, in samples uh, from patients. Um, so what else can we learn from that? And so the real mystery that we were trying to solve is, are the double strand breaks that happen at these other sites uh, outside of the IGH locus, are they random? Uh, or is there some event that will allow us to predict if they're, if they're gonna happen in a certain region? And so in order for us to study that, we actually created a database of over 2000 human translocation breakpoints uh, just to map exactly where the translocations are occurring uh, outside of the IGH locus, so the non-IGH uh, double strand breaks. And what we found from this compiling all this data was really quite remarkable. Um, so if we just take the BCL2 region to begin with, we can see that each of these lines here represents a DNA double strand break that was mapped in a human patient. And we can see that um, these double strand breaks can occur anywhere in this 29 kilobase pair region but 50% of all the double strand breaks occur in this 175 base pair region known as the MBR or major breakpoint region. 
And so you can, that's illustrated by this, this pinwheel here showing that there's a large accumulation of double strand breaks in this relatively tiny region of, um, of BCL2. And we term, we call regions like this uh, human fragile zones because they seem to be bro uh, prone to breakage. Um, and we've actually noted that there are several of them uh, when we compiled all this data. And so we can see that BCL2 actually has two uh, or three um, of these uh, fragile zones. Uh, so we have the, the minor cluster region and the uh, intermediate cluster region. Um, and we can also note that another, this MTC or major translocation cluster um, that is downstream of the cyclone D1 gene. Um, and again, here we see that uh, any of these double strand breaks can happen in this 340 kilobase pair region here, um, but a large portion of them are, are all occurring in this 150 base pair region. So clearly what we have here is a case where there is a focal double strand break uh, formation happening. So this is non-random. Uh, and so the real goal was to understand what is the nature of what's causing the DNA double strand breaks uh, in this system. Uh, and I should note that uh, in contrast to what's going on with say the, uh, the BCR able translocation, the Philadelphia chromosome, the reason that a lot of these translocations uh, lead to a hyperproliferative state uh, also has to just to do with the physiology, physiology of, uh, of the IGH locus where um, these oncogenes, BCL2 and cyclone D1, uh, this translocation actually puts them in close proximity to say the mu enhancer um, that, that is driving transcription uh, at the heavy chain locus. Um, and that's likely what's causing these, uh, these, these oncogenes to be uh, dysregulated uh, and leading to them uh, not dying and becoming hyperproliferative. Okay. So what we have here is a case of double strand breaks. And so I should note that uh, these, these fragile zones that we look at, um, they're not conserved so that they're not present in mice. Uh, and mice don't have the same pattern of double strand breaks that we see. So in mice, we have a lot of breaks that are occurring outside of the IGH locus near promoter regions. Most of these human fragile zones are occurring in non-coding regions. Um, they don't really seem to be that remarkable at all in terms of what's going on uh, at the chromatin level. Um, but they also seem to be mostly break prone in B cells. And so that kind of limits our search about what could be going on here to processes that are relevant in B cells. And in looking for prime suspects of what could be driving these DNA double strand breaks, uh, one of the clear uh, enzymes that's present in B cells that could be um, likely causing uh, or causative feature is activation induced cytidine deaminase or AID. So this is a B cell specific uh, mutator and it's most probably uh, likely known for the fact that in more mature B cells, you get very high ramping up of AID expression um, to drive processes like class switch recombination and also uh, somatic hypermutation to again, generate the different antibody classes and to further, uh, further enhance the variable regions of different antigens. But what studies have also shown is that there is some creeping uh, leaky transcription of AID in the pre and pro B cell stage when BDJ is happening. Uh, and so one of our hypotheses was is that it's this uh, leaky AID expression that just so happens to be occurring during the BDJ region that could be a culprit in, in leading to these translocations. Uh, and further evidence of that is here. So what's important to understand about AID is that one, it only acts on single-stranded DNA. So the DNA has to be single-stranded for AID to actually access it. And it also has a sequence preference. Um, and so the sequences that it really likes are these WGCW sequences, where it will deaminate the C uh, in the sequence where a W can be either an A or a T. Um, and so it, it hits these a lot. And if you look at switch regions, um, as I'll show in a little bit, um, that require AID for breakage uh, during class switcher combination, we see that those switch regions are really chock full of these WGCW sequences. Um, so while this is the most preferred one, we do see kind of a, uh, a sequence preferences for C in other contexts. Uh, and also um, these cases where you have a uh, purine followed by a CG, so it'll deaminate those. So if we go back to our patient data, so what we're zooming in here is the MBR at the nucleotide level, where each of these triangles represents a double strand break that was mapped in a human patient. Uh, we see that there's, even within this, uh, this focal region, there's even a further uh, focus of DNA double strand breaks within these three peaks. And at the center of each of these three peaks are these CG regions uh, that we feel are likely targeted by AID. So this gets us kind of part of the way there. So we feel like there's evidence showing that AID is uh, affecting these fragile regions. Uh, but again, since this DNA has to be single-stranded, 
um, and CGs certainly aren't a unique motif in the genome, what is it about these fragile zones that's leading uh, to increased AI, AID activity and potentially uh, genome instability? So to get at that really gets at the, the project, like where I picked it up during my postdoc. So the, the idea was, is that um, taking my experience in DNA double strand break repair, what I wanted to do was know if there was actually something about the sequences themselves, uh, these fragile sequences, that is leading to them being prone to breakage, or if it's something that only happens in a certain chromosome context or in B cells. And so the idea here was, is that if I can take these fragile regions, since they're pretty small, take them out of the B cell and put them into a model genetic system, uh, so in this case, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, can we still measure instability specifically at these fragile zones? And if we can, that would indicate to us that there's actually something about the, the sequences of these human fragile zones that are uh, making them breakage prone. Um, and so what are some of these features? Well, we, we know that they are very highly, uh, the GC percent is slightly increased. Um, they have clusters of Gs. Um, they have, and we feel like it, that, that, that part of it is probably what's leading to a lot of this instability. Um, but we really wanted to have a genetic test where we can actually um, pin down uh, instability at these fragile zones through a quantitative genetic assay. And so the assay developed is shown here um, and there's no point in going into tons of detail about this, but essentially what it is is that it's on uh, one arm of a non-essential chromosome. These are done in haploid cells, so there's only one copy of each chromosome. And essentially it consists of four selectable markers. Uh, and so this pink box here represents where we can insert the human fragile zone of interest. Uh, on the telomeric side, we have three markers uh, here, so Euro3, CAN1, and CANMX4. And on the centromeric side, we have one marker, this LICE2. So the idea is, is that by um, inserting a human fragile zone into this region, we can detect double strand breaks at that fragile region by selecting for loss of these three uh, or telomeric markers and retention of this one centromeric marker here, indicating that double strand break occurred uh, somewhere in this region that's sandwiched between these two markers. So as the first proof of, proof of concept that we can actually, uh, this assay would actually work is um, what we wanted to do is go to a region uh, as a part of DNA that in mammals that we know is uh, unstable um, in both bacteria, yeast, and, and in human cells. Um, and so this was kind of a positive control for this assay. And what this was, was looking at one of the class switch regions. And so what I'm showing here is that we're able to take um, 12 of the 44 repeats from the Murin S gamma 3 switch, switch region. Uh, so that's shown here. So this is again all downstream of the VDJ on the three prime ends of the IGH uh, region. And with the way these switch regions uh, work, as I'm sure you're aware, is that double strand breaks created within the switch regions uh, lead to the rearrangements that will fuse these different uh, other regions together to create these different antibody classes. Uh, and what's been shown through previous research is that 12 of these alone is enough to lead to genome instability. And just to briefly touch on exactly how class switcher combination is working and how it's different from BDJ, they're actually very different mechanisms. Uh, I just kind of wanted to briefly go over it as it'll be relevant for some of the results that I'm gonna talk about uh, in this assay. Um, but essentially what goes on here is then, again, it's very dependent on AID. Um, if you don't have AID, this process doesn't work at all. Um, and again, it depends on the fact that AID recognizes single-stranded DNA. And so what happens is you have transcription through a sterile promoter, meaning a promoter that doesn't actually encode anything. Um, through these switch regions. And these switch regions are such that they have a very high GC per, uh, uh, percentage, and they have these clusters uh, of Gs um, and Cs that are together. And the idea is, is that as transcription moves through here, um, creating this sterile transcript, it's, uh, what can happen is, is that um, you could get creation of these uh, structures called R loops. And essentially what an R loop is, is after you can imagine the transcription machinery went through here, instead of the DNA uh, re, re annealing to create a double-stranded uh, DNA, it actually interacts with the, uh, the, the nascent RNA tail uh, from the transcript. And it's actually this RNA that re anneals to the DNA, looping out this one strand of uh, DNA. Uh, and this DNA is very C-rich uh, because the template here is very G-rich. And these Cs are prone to being hit by AID. And so what happens, and these can be kilobases long, so very long structures. Uh, and so this presents a perfect target for AID where it has this long uh, single-stranded DNA structures that are, have these Cs in them. Uh, the Cs are generated, are created to use uh, because that's how much you need DNA to C. Um, and then what happens is the basic system repair process recognizes these Us. 
And so you have the aerosol glycosylase coming in to remove the U, leaving an abasic site, uh, which APE1 then cleaves the back rib bone, generating these DNA double strand breaks. Um, and likely there's some small amount of single strandedness on the other side. And it's through this uh, nicking of each strand of DNA that eventually leads to a DNA double strand break um, and rearrangement of these different switch regions. Okay. Uh, so again, the process is much different than what's thought to be going on for the fragile regions, um, but it does provide a nice positive control for a mammalian sequence that we know is uh, breakage, prone to breakage. And so that was the first sequence that we actually ran through this assay um, just as a test. And so what these results here are showing, just to kind of go through it a little bit, um, is that we express the results in terms of a double strand break rate. So this is the rate of double strand break formation from, from this assay. Um, and what you can see is that uh, it's quite a sensitive assay. And so the double strand break rate here is 10 times 10 to the 10. Uh, and so that means that the actual frequency here would be 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10. And so it's, a very, uh, it's very sensitive to detecting these breaks. And if we just have a wild type uh, sequence here that just has transcription alone, but no fragile region of any kind, we see the vast majority of all the results uh, actually give us no recombinance at all. And so that's why all these, uh, all these dots are down here uh, at the bottom here. Um, we always get some outliers, um, but for here we can consider each of these numbers here the median rate. And for here, the median rate is just quite, quite small. And so we use different mathematical formulas to kind of generate the rate in these cases. Uh, so the rate here would be 1.8. Um, but we can see that when we, one of the major uh, changes that when we just put the switch region in is that we see a dramatic increase in the double strand break rate. And so it goes from essentially undetectable uh, to uh, we get this 16 times 10 to the 10 uh, recombination or double strand break rate here. And we can see that almost all of the cells tested uh, resulted in some type of recombinant. Um, so as I said before, AID is uh, required for class switch recombination and we can you'd see that when we express AID in the yeast cells, so this is a human colon optimized AID, uh, we see a further dramatic and significant increase in the double strand break rate uh, here going up about another tenfold uh, due to the activity of AID in these yeast cells. So what this shows us is something important that we can actually take mammalian sequence and show that it is fragile um, in the yeast system and that it actually is following some of the same rules that we would expect for uh, what's going on in B cells and the fact that we are seeing this uh, induction of double strand breaks through the AID. Okay, so having established that the assay worked for that, what we wanted to do was take two of the fragile regions that we know of, uh, so the MBR and MTC, and then plug them into this assay. And so these were actually cloned out of human sequences. Uh, and so they have some flaking sequence. So it's this 338 base pair uh, region uh, contains the 175 base pair MBR, as well as some flanking regions here. Uh, and then we just, just literally plug that into the assay, um, again, with a uh, promoter upstream of these regions. Um, because as I go into further detail at some point that um, it does seem that you do have to have some transcription going through these regions to see a lot of these effects, just to kind of get the DNA separated um, these sites. And what we saw here was uh, quite different than what we saw with the switch regions. Um, so if we look here, this is, so the black is with no uh, fragile region, the blue, um, is with the MBR and the green is with the MTC. And this coloring is consistent throughout the rest of the talk. We can see that if we just look at the wild type cells, we don't see much of an induction of double strand breaks with just the fragile zones present at all. So it seems that they're just statically sitting there in the genome. They're not really leading to a large number of DNA double strand breaks. Uh, this is quite different though, if we induce AID in the system. Again, we feel like AID is the prime suspect for what's driving these double strand breaks, even at the fragile zones. Uh, and again, we see this uh, 62, uh, or this, this large increase, uh, almost 30 fold increase in the double strand break rate with AID alone. Um, and when we express AID with MBR and MTC, we do see a significant increase, uh, particularly with uh, MTC. It's not dramatic though. Uh, it's not the same that we had saw with the uh, switch region, um, but it is enough to kind of at least show that we are seeing some AID activity at, at these, uh, these regions indicating that they likely are single-stranded at some point uh, during this process in the yeast system. But we wanted to see if there was a way to kind of ramp up the uh, effects at these uh, fragile zones. So one thing that we know to be important from previous work is that uh, not only, so we know that transcription going through these regions, uh, at least in the yeast system, seems to lead to an increase in double strand breaks. So what's going on with transcription? So one thing that when you have a transcription uh, RNA polymerase II, going through your DNA, uh, one of the things that that creates is torsional stress. 
And so as you're unwinding the DNA uh, ahead of the RNA polymerase II, um, you know, you're creating uh, increased uh, positive supercoiling. And behind the RNA polymerase II, you have uh, increased negative supercoiling as the DNA is a little bit looser. Uh, and so you thought that maybe torsional stress could be something that was really driving um, uh, these, these fragile regions to, sh to, to form into like kind of a, a non-B form structure that would generate increased single-stranded DNA if they, were if they were subjected to further torsional stress. Um, and this, is, this was based on results that we did with um, native bisulfite sequencing. And so if you expose DNA to bisulfite under native conditions, if the DNA is single-stranded, it's unprotected, and the bisulfite will interact with it. Whereas if it's single strand or if it's double-stranded, then the bisulfite can't interact with the uh, with the C's in that sequence, and you end up not seeing a, uh, a signal from the bisulfite sequencing. Um, what this is showing is the results of bisulfite sequencing, just looking at the MBR in this blue box here, and we clearly saw that if this was performed in a supercoiled plasmid versus a linear plasmid, that there was a clear increase in the uh, level of uh, bisulfite signal here, again, indicating that perhaps these fragile regions are sensitive to torsional stress. So in yeast, this is fairly straightforward to look at. Um, yeast, and like uh, most eukaryotes, have three different classes of topo isomerases. Uh, the two that are most relevant for this uh, conversation are TOPE1 and TOPE2. Uh, deleting TOPE2 in yeast is lethal, um, uh, but deleting TOPE1 uh, is viable. And so the idea here was that if we could delete uh, this TOPO isomerase 1 gene, uh, it would decrease the cell's ability to deal with torsional stress uh, and, in effect, increasing the torsional stress that we're seeing in these cells. And that, was, that seemed to indeed be the case. So again, uh, what we're showing here is, um, and each of these instances, deleting TOP1 by itself did not lead to much of an indicator. Um, and, and so each of the, again, these dots is showing um, a single trial, um, but it's probably easier just to focus on the numbers up here, which is the median uh, double strand break rate here. And you can see there isn't much change with that. Um, again, I'm showing the AID for each of these uh, systems here. And what we see here, quite remarkably, is if we combine AID expression with loss of topoisomerase 1, um, with no fragile zone present, we don't see any significant change between uh, with or without uh, TOP1. But this isn't the case for the fragile region. So here we do see that uh, with MBR and in particular with MTC, there's a significant increase in the double strand break rate um, when TOP1 is lacking. And what we think is happening here is that, um, again, AID needs this region to be single stranded to recognize it. And we feel is that when you have increased torsional stress, um, you're probably getting buckling of that DNA. And that probably leads to more stabilization of these single-stranded DNA structures uh, in, in here. And so if these single-stranded DNA structures are, are more stable, that gives AID more opportunity to recognize them. Um, and we're thinking that the increase in the double-strand break rate is due to um, more recognition by AID and more DNA double-strand breaks created by the UNG, AP, and the nuclease. So clearly torsional stress has one effect, um, but we can also examine this under a different context. So we can directly test this model um, if this is how AID-induced breaks occur um, by, again, creating a deletion in yeast that deletes the uracil glycosylase UNG1. Uh, so the idea here is, is that if UNG1 isn't present to remove the U, that never gives AP endonuclease the opportunity to cleave the A-basic site, leading to the double strand break. Um, and again, if we just look at the, uh, with no fragile zone here, we can indeed see the case. So UNG1 by itself does nothing. Uh, we see this large increase when we express AID, but that craters once we delete UNG1. So if UNG1 isn't present uh, for this process, uh, essentially AID has no effect, at least on double strand breaks. If you actually looked at the mutations that are occurring here, you would see that they would be skyrocketing uh, because you can't get rid of these U's in the genome. But at least in terms of creating DNA double strand breaks, this obviously goes down to almost what you see uh, with no AID expression at all. What was really surprising to us, though, was that if we looked at the same results, um, in each of the fragile zones, this wasn't the case. We weren't seeing a drop off completely back to what we see without AID. For both MBR and N MTC, there was a still a significant number of double strand breaks being created in this context. Um, and so our question was like, well, what's going on here? Um, is it just possible that um, because these MBR and MTC have more regions that are recognized by AID, uh, is there something then weird happening to that sequence that may makes them be more unstable? And so our idea was is that if you get rid of ung one and you have these U's hanging out, um, you're going to end up with a lot of mismatches in the DNA. Um, and we feel that these mismatches 
are going to persist because there's no enzyme to get rid of the uracil in these cases. And these persistent lesions could lead to um, double strand breaks that are occurring at the site. So in order to test that, we needed some type of a nucleus that was present in the system uh, that could somehow maybe cleave these persistent le lesions and lead to these double strand break phenotype that we're seeing. So how, again, just to briefly talk on how would this be relevant uh, to humans, because there aren't a lot of people walking around with an ung one mutation. Um, and the idea here is that these persistent lesions would be relevant because um, unlike yeast, uh, humans and most mammals methylate their, their genome. And so you have these methylated Cs that are present in the genome. And when AID recognizes a methyl C, it actually converts it to a T. Um, and these Ts are not repaired as quickly as a U in the genome. Um, so it could be that if persistent lesions are a problem uh, for double strand break formation, uh, that it could be related to the methylation state uh, of the fragile region, uh, which is something that we plan to explore further once we get more into uh, looking at these in, in human cells. So but again, what we wanted to see is if there was a way to cleave these persistent lesions and if cleavage of those lesions is, was leading to more double strand breaks at fragile zones in this case. Um, and for that, I need to go back to looking at BDJ recombination again and looking at a factor I didn't really go into before, but is essentially critical for uh, BDJ recombination to occur. So one thing I didn't mention was that when RAG creates these NICs, uh, the type of end that's created is actually a hairpin. So it's not a clean uh, DNA double strand break end. Um, and one of the only enzymes known that can cleave this hairpin is an enzyme called Artemis, which is a nuclease. Um, and we know that because if you have mutations in Artemis, uh, it leads to a skid phenotype because again, you're unable to repair, open up these hairpins to allow for DNA repair. And so the way this process works, um, not only in BDJ, but essentially in all NHEJ, is that when you have a DNA double strand break that is created, one of the first things that happens is the Ku complex binds to that. So Ku has a high affinity for DNA double strand break ends, and it's highly plentiful in the cell. Uh, and so it binds to the double strand break ends to protect it. Uh, and the Ku bound end is actually a substrate for this enzyme, uh, which I mentioned before, DNA PKCS. So DNA PKCS binds, and it actually autophosphorylates itself. Um, and and this, this kinase activity then, after it autophosphorylates, uh, recruits Artemis to the site of the double strand break. Um, and Artemis is then phosphorylated by DNA PKCS, leading to it becoming an active uh, nuclease. Um, and so there's still a lot of studies to understand how this Artemis activation works. Um, but what it appears to be is that the C-terminal tail of Artemis actually interacts with its active site and actually binds that active site. And that phosphorylation of the C-terminal tail by DNA PKCS is what leads to Artemis becoming an active nuclease. So the reason that's relevant for, for these persistent lesions and what we're looking at in these cells is that biochemically it's been shown, shown that not only can Artemis uh, cleave hairpins, uh, but several different types of DNA structures that have single-stranded, double-stranded DNA boundaries. Uh, one of them being the types of loops that you would expect to be created by mismatches in the genome. Uh, so our thinking was is that if we could have these uh, double strand breaks that are present in the genome or these persistent lesions, uh, would an active Artemis then cleave these regions? Um, so one drawback to doing this in yeast, uh, or, or maybe not necessarily a drawback, is the fact that yeast doesn't have Artemis. It doesn't have DNA, PK, DP, uh, DNA PKCS. So even if yeast did have Artemis, it had, would no, have no way of activating it. Um, but what we actually found through biochemical studies was that you can actually create a truncated form of Artemis, uh, which we did, so this Artemis 413, which gets rid of the C-terminal tail. And what that does is essentially uh, remove the requirement for activation by DNA PK and allows you to have a considerably active Artemis present in the genome. So the thinking was is that if we could have this considerably active Artemis, would we then see a change um, with these persistent lesions? And um, Interestingly, uh, at least in terms of the UNG1 AID, the answer was, well, yes and no. Uh, so again, if we combine uh, this Artemis, which I'm showing as A413 here, what we see is that that constrictive activity, at least with no fragile zone, does lead to an increase in the double strand break rate that's significant. Um, but what's interesting is it doesn't really have much of an effect at all uh, with the MBR, the MTC. Uh, these are still hovering right about around where we saw with just the UNG1 uh, deletion and AID expression alone. Um, again, we further tested that with the class switch region and kind of like what we see with the no fragile region here, again, we see a significant increase uh, when we add Artemis. Um, but again, we were kind of wondering, well, what's going on here? Is this something specific about the AID regions? Uh, so to further explore this, what we wanted to know was, 
if we could create a persistent lesion through some other mechanism besides through AID, that would be relevant to B cells. Um, and so one thing that we uh, considered was that if, since these regions are guanine rich and guanine is uh, easily oxidized by reactive oxygen species, um, and if the DNA is single stranded, it could be more exposed to ROS. Um, if we increase the ROS in these cells, do we see a different uh, type of persistent lesion forming that would have AID, more activity with AID? Um, and so we were able to do that in yeast by looking at a, a peroxyridoxin mutant, this TSA1. And so essentially all you need to know is that by deleting TSA1, we see an increase in ROS. And here we actually saw one of the most dramatic increases that's related to the fragile zones in our yeast system. Um, if we look here at just Artemis activity alone in each of these three contexts, we see that just having this nuclease present in the cells isn't really doing a whole lot. Um, if we have TSA1 uh, mutation, which again is increased ROS, uh, we see a kind of an across the board increase in the DNA double strand break rate at these. Uh, so it's elevated about tenfold, um, but again, it, that's pretty consistent for each of the contexts. Uh, what's really amazing is that when we combine Artemis with the TSA1 mutant is that we see a large and uh, uh, largely significant increase specifically in the MBR and MTC. Um, so it's also present in the uh, no fragile zone region here. I mean, you can see it goes up about another tenfold when you have uh, the synergistic uh, activity of the increased ROS and uh, the Artemis. Um, but the difference here between with, with and without the fragile zones are actually quite significant, um, indicating that unlike with the AID persistent lesions, um, that at least through ROS, uh, these persistent lesions do seem to be affected by AID. Uh, I mean, not AID, uh, by Artemis, rather. Um, and so, again, it's kind of showing that there is a, seems to be some types of a context where Artemis activity could be relevant for DNA double strand break formation, um, perhaps if not with, uh, with AID, perhaps with something like ROS. Um, and in some of the studies in my lab, we've actually seen that uh, treatment with different types of topoisomerase drugs actually has much different uh, uh, effects with Artemis as well. So this is something that we're actively exploring in the lab is exactly how these different persistent lesions are forming. Uh, and that kind of brings us to the model that I started my lab with uh, about a year ago uh, with a lot of the, the work that I did in my postdoc essentially where we have a multi-step process that's leading to DNA double strand breaks at these fragile zones that eventually leads to these translocations, uh, where you have the uh, transcription or torsional stress that is stressing these fragile regions. And because of the sequences of these fragile regions, these regions are prone to forming these non-B DNA structures that have single-stranded um, DNA in them. And uh, then that moves to the next phase where the single-stranded DNA that's generated can be a target for different processes. So uh, in some cases, it could be AID that's present in the B cells. In other cases, it could be increased ROS, uh, both with the result that these would lead to persistent lesions that would be present, um, de further destabilizing those fragile regions. Um, and then again, these persistent lesions are cleaved somehow. Um, at least in the case of ROS, we seem to have pretty good evidence that this is occurring through Artemis. Um, it's not as clear what could be happening at the fragile zones um, with AID, but it does. it is clear that um, at least some of the persistent lesions created by AID are cleaved by Artemis, uh, leading to these DNA double strand breaks. Uh, and so that's essentially the model that is the basis of a lot of the work that we're doing in the lab, uh, and kind of took me all the work up to where, uh, where we currently are. Um, so now, what are we kind of doing to address this further in our lab currently at UCI? Um, and what I really wanted to do was take a lot of this information um, that we've learned from the yeast system and actually now apply it to uh, a human, human cells to see if a lot of these uh, things we've discovered actually hold true in that context as well. And so what I briefly wanna go over in the, in the short time that I have left is exactly what we're doing right now in the lab um, and how we're, we plan on studying these fragile regions in the future. And the key for me to study anything genetically uh, or through a molecular mechanism is to develop an assay where we can actually have a quantifiable number uh, pinned to the, the breakage formation. And so our starting point here is actually trying to measure double strand breaks at fragile regions in a B cell line. And so the line we're starting with now is this NALM6, which is a human pre-B cell line. Um, the reason that we like this cell line is that it has a fairly stable karyotype. Um, it is uh, from an ALL, but none of the translocations or, or fragile regions are actually mutated in these cells. We can actually study the fragile regions. Uh, and also through a collaboration, several knockouts are available for different DNA repair genes. So it was a really good um, system for that. The problem is it's not really a genetic system. 
And so this whole process of inserting all these different marker genes like we did in yeast just isn't going to work. It would be a very time intensive and laborious process uh, to try and do that. And so the real question we had was, well, how do we study these DNA double strand breaks in the context of cells in a quantifiable way? Um, and a lot of that really gets back to NHEJ. And so, as I mentioned, when a double strand break occurs in these cells, there's a lot of options for how the break can be repaired. But in a, the vast majority of the time in all mammalian cells, um, they're repaired through NHEJ, which is this process highlighted here. So how is that relevant to this discussion? Uh, it turns out that, you know, if you want to maintain genomic integrity, NHEJ, even though it's the most prevalent repair strategy, isn't really your best bet. Um, mostly because it's an iterative process that can quickly and efficiently put cells back together, but it usually never, or DNA back together, but never puts it back exactly as the way it was before in most cases. Uh, and so what this is showing is that double strand breaks can be very diverse. And when you have who binding to protect these ends, who is this tool belt that recruits all these different uh, um, players, so polymerases, nucleases, and the ligase, um, and through this iterative process of trying to knit back together this DNA, what happens the vast majority of the time is that you get small deletions or insertions within this sequence uh, to, uh, to change that sequence. So we, we think of these as informational scars. So essentially, uh, if NHEJ leaves its print uh, on a region of DNA that it repaired through these small indels. And that's what we kind of wanted to take advantage of uh, to look at this assay for measuring double strand break formation in human cells. And so instead of trying to um, insert markers where we can kind of select for these events to occur, we just want to see if we can see if they're occurring anyway uh, by looking for these informational scars. So one approach that you can do to do that is just to um, sequence, do tons and tons of sequencing, uh, and sequence the fragile regions in particular to see if it shows evidence of these scars. Um, but we actually wanted to try and employ a more quantitative approach, which has been somewhat challenging. Um, but some recent technology has allowed for that to, to start actually being more uh, of a goal that can be realized. And so what we've been working on now is using a system by Biorad that's called Droplet Digital PCR. Uh, so just if you're not familiar with this, essentially what it does is you have a, a standard PCR reaction, like 25 microliters. And through this process, you actually partition uh, that 25 microliter PCR reaction into 20,000 uh, nanoliter sized droplets. And each of these droplets then uh, have a portion of your genomic DNA of interest uh, trapped inside of them. And within each of these 20,000 droplets, you can perform a PCR reaction. So essentially in one well of a 96 well plate, you can perform 20,000 PCR reactions. With each of these PCRs, uh, each of these droplets eventually giving you a, a signal uh, to tell whether or not uh, a certain event had occurred uh, within that, within that partition, the DNA that's partitioned in those droplets. Uh, and so we use this QX200 system and essentially the workflow is, is that um, you just mix your sample with oil to create these droplets, which is shown here uh, in this process. You go through a PCR amplification step. And then in the case of what we're doing is that um, the droplets are generated in this uh, droplet generation unit here. And then you just put the 96 well plate into your droplet reader. And each of the droplets uh, in a single well are analyzed one at a time and run through a fluorescent detector. And then each of those fluorescent signals is compiled onto a chart that'll tell you uh, which droplet uh, had which signal uh, in there. And so how does that work for us? So essentially the assay that we're developing, it's called a uh, drop-off assay. And essentially it takes advantage of the fact that you would have two TACMAN probes um, and that one of these probes would be sensitive to NHEJ events because of the informational scarring that occurs during NHEJ repair. So essentially to one amplicon, you have two TACMAN probes binding. One would be specific for the fragile zone of interest, say MBR. And the other one would be a reference probe that isn't uh, targeted. And the idea would be is you have double strand breaks happening that are repaired by NHEJ. Um, this uh, MBR probe can no longer bind. And what you end up with is amplicons that are only able to uh, uh, fluoresce with the reference probe. And the way that that would look is essentially you would have several different signals being generated. So if you have this large orange signal, that indicates that you have both uh, fluorescent probes fluorescing in those droplets. Um, however, if you start to see an increase in the green only, that means that you're losing the, the blue signal. And so those are dropping out of this orange signal here um, to indicate that you're only seeing the reference probe binding. Okay. Um, so one thing I should also mention is that kind of spoiler alert is that if you actually sequence these fragile regions in NOM6, um, they're not really mutated. And so what that tells us is that again, kind of like in the yeast system, um, when these DNA regions are uh, just, just sitting there statically, 
uh, there's not really a whole lot going on uh, to lead to double strand breaks. Um, and so what we actually feel is that just sitting around doing nothing in the genome isn't what leads to these double strand breaks and these translocations, but it actually requires a trigger event. Uh, and this trigger event we feel in B cells is actually the double strand break that's unrepaired at RAG. Uh, and the reason we feel that is again, because um, the influence of both AID and also the Artemis that gets activated that's required for RAG induction uh, seems to be necessary to generate these DNA double strand breaks. And so one problem, again, with using the cell line is that we can't really induce the breaks at the uh, IGH locus. Uh, these cells have been growing continuously since the 70s, uh, and they express RAG, and so essentially their entire BDJ region has already been recombined. And so the way that we're going to get around that is we're going to mimic uh, RAG-induced breaks in close proximity to these uh, fragile zones by inducing double-strand breaks uh, at different distances away from the fragile zone of interest uh, using a, a CRISPR-Cas9 system. So we have small guide RNAs that are targeting that. Um, so this is kind of getting ahead of ourselves because we don't even know if this assay will really work yet or not. And so again, just the, as far as we've gotten so far, is just completing the proof of principle type of uh, assay where we've actually used the Cas9, a small guide RNA that targets the MBR region uh, just to see if we can detect that in our droplet PCR system. Uh, and so my postdoc, Jason, is the one who's been working on this the most. Um, and these are the results from that here that I'll just go through quickly through time, uh, since we're about out of time here. Um, the biggest challenge that Jason had was actually just uh, transport, transfecting the vector that contains the Cas9 and the small guide RNA into the cells. Um, but with help from uh, uh, some instrumentation from Peter Donovan, we were actually able to get a high level of uh, transfection into our NALM6 cells, uh, indicated by the increase in GF GFP in these cells. Um, and so under certain conditions, we were shown that we actually had a high amount of transfection of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, and so the next thing was to actually then uh, see if the small guide RNAs were actually damaging the MBR. Um, and so Jason tested two different small guide RNAs, so small guide RNA one and two. And these are actually the raw results from our DDPCR assay. So each of these little dots indicates a fluorescent signal from a single droplet in the assay. And what we can see is that in untransfected cells, again, we don't see that many green dots. Um, but for the small guide RNA too, uh, which seems to be cutting at a much higher frequency at the, at the MBR, we do see this increase in, um, in the green droplets here, indicative of the drop off of the MBR probe and double strand breaks being created uh, due to Cas9. And this has just shown a histogram that's much more quantifiable showing that the small guide RNA too is leading to about 20% of these uh, of the cell population having uh, a break by NATJ. And so that's been the kind of major hurdle that we've been trying to get through right now. And we're still doing a lot of uh, troubleshooting to try and get this system active uh, for looking at the, the breaks uh, in NOM6. But the hope is, is that we can eventually translate this into looking at patient samples um, to quantitate uh, whether or not fragile zone breaks are occurring at those sites as well. Um, so then briefly, again, our model here is, is that we require this DNA double strand break that's induced at RAG. We have low levels of AID expression that are creating U or T mismatches in these cells. Uh, once uh, Artemis is activated by the activity of Ku DNA PKCS, um, these uh, persistent lesions can be cleaved. And we feel like this most likely is what's leading to these DNA double strand breaks that are occurring at the non-IGH sites and eventually the translocations. So with all of that, I'll just end and thank uh, everyone in my lab and all the people surrounding my lab who been able to beg, borrow, and steal from to get a lot of the stuff up and running uh, in, our, in our system. Um, and if there's some time left, I can be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Nick. That was really outstanding, really interesting story, uh, and uh, a model of molecular biology uh, in there, and some really cool techniques as well. I think we have time for two or three uh, Questions. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but please either add something or. Hi. Uh, uh, just, could I ask a question, up. Eric? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I actually have like two questions for you. Um, are you worried about uh, basically like non native AID expression in yeast introducing some genomic instability, instability into the yeast? So you're like missing some DSB events that you would normally pick up, only that you're introducing so much genetic instability in the yeast genome that 
the cells are no longer viable. I'm not sure like what the kinetics look like for that. Um, and then also, do you know, or I guess, have you considered or is there a promoter in the yeast toolkit that recapitulates AID, like native AID expression levels? Um, um, yeah, Zach, those are both really good questions. Um, and so, again, I mean, there's a lot of differences between obviously what's going on in yeast, and we have noticed mm -hmm. that the AID activity um, is pretty prevalent in the yeast. And so it is possible that we are missing some events. Um, and so, especially since our assay selects for something very specific, the loss of that one chromosome arm, uh, <laughs> one thing that we feel is that that probably underestimates the number of double strand breaks that we're seeing already, mm -hmm. where you'll probably have a lot of stuff where it just breaks and repairs several times before it actually cleaves off. Mm -hmm. um, but one way we've been trying to avoid a lot of those uh, artifacts is just that since we know AID is so effective, um, we only introduce it to the cells when we're actually testing it. So the hope is that we're not generating a lot of excess mutations within those cells. Oh, uh, okay. And the other question is, is that the promoter we're using is like a, a really strong promoter in yeast, so this galactose promoter. And so that's AID expression is really uh, ramped up in, in these mature B cells, but it could also be if we use the more native motor that we could probably dial up or down those events uh, more or less in those cells. Yeah, I was wondering if you could like titrate AID expression to demonstrate that you get like, you know, a linear increase in DS DSBs or, you know, potentially the kinetics are a little different. I don't know. Yeah, I think for sure. And there are, there are um, some uh, promoters like that that you can even use in yeast where if you increase a certain level of a drug like this DOCS, you see more or less transcription and you can actually mm -hmm. ramp it up at a very controlled rate. Mm -hmm. I think Nick, if you could talk a little bit about how this would apply, uh, a little more specifically, how would this apply when you're getting um, patient samples from Angela or from, from whomever, and how we would begin to uh, use these techniques to, uh, to, to find that association? How does it work? How, how yeah. Would it I think, um, yeah, I think what I'm really excited about is the DDPCR again, because we can take these cells and unmanipulate it and actually monitor them from, for, uh, for these uh, genome instability at these different fragile sites. And one thing I'm wondering is that we could look at different patients that say already have one translocation, like say a BCL2 translocation. And if our hypothesis were correct, then um, if a double strand break, if, if there was a break at a fragile region at BCL2, if all of these are occurring in BDJ cells um, at a certain time during these pre-B cell stage, we might see evidence uh, in those patients of instability at other fragile regions. And so if we have these separate different fragile regions, the question could be like, we take a follicular lymphoma patient uh, that has the BCL2 translocation, is there evidence that there's instability to the other fragile regions? Um, as, and kind of say like, well, is that an indicator of the mechanism behind it? Interesting, yeah, well, that's great. Bit... And I think there's a lot of opportunity too to look at people with different genetic backgrounds or people that have been exposed to radiation or chemotherapy to see if that leads to instability at these sites. That's a really good point. Or COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, could be. Um, uh, there are no. Other, are there any other questions? Uh, I'm not hearing from anyone. Um, I would thank you again for a great talk, Nick. I would also just for those who are still listening in, um, we have this was not good planning, but uh, Ken Hayama in the Demetrio Lab is is giving his defense uh, at two o'clock this afternoon. So those of you who can make it, uh, please join in. Uh, it'll be a really interesting story. Uh, but other than that, thanks again for everyone for joining us and for Nick for giving a really intriguing uh, talk. And, yeah, thanks uh, everybody. We'll see you next week for um, for uh, the um, uh, for the seminars next week. It's going to be really good. Okay, thanks a lot. Take care, everyone.